Father, you've given us your word. You've given us your spirit. You've given us your son. You know what we have need of. You know what we need to hear. You know what our hearts need. I pray, Lord, that you would do the work that only you can do. Oh, mighty, sovereign, loving God, help us. Please help me. In Jesus' name, amen. Open your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3. Verse 16. Colossians 3.16 Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. We looked at that last week. What is the outcome of that? What's the point? What, what, what is the reason for filling up your heart and your mind with the truth of Christ. What are you learning for? What what are you doing with all of that knowledge? What are you doing with all of these glorious truths that is going into your mind and your heart? You're studying, you're reading, you're meditating, you're memorizing, and the question comes, why? My hope, my hope for you and for me is that the first and primary thing is that you are doing all of this to draw near to God. That you are growing in holiness, that you are enjoying the beauty of Christ, that you are being led by the Holy Spirit and not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. This is critical, right? I was asked last week at fellowship, what, what happens to us? We, we hear a message, we read the word, we hear a song, and our hearts are stirred, our eyes are focused. We are like, okay, I want God, and I want to go after Him with all of my might. Spirit of God, help me. And we start, and we're going good, and then something happens, and we get cold, it becomes routine, it becomes, it becomes dry. And as we were going back and forth, we concluded something subtle takes place. Our eyes are fixed on Christ, and subtly we shift our eyes away from Christ to truth about Christ. We're not supposed to be drawing near to doctrine. We're not supposed to be drawing near to truth. We are to draw near to God through doctrine, through truth, but the goal is always God. And we lose sight of that. And when that happens, we're no longer pursuing a person. We are pursuing facts, information, knowledge. And it happens to us all. But you're supposed to be walking with the person of God. You're supposed to be fixing your eyes on the person of Christ. You're supposed to be walking in step, being led by the Spirit so you do not 
grieve Him. That's why we're supposed to be letting the Word of Christ dwell in us richly. That's what it's supposed to be about. Is that what you're doing? Are you finding in any way your walk with Christ has become cold or dry or empty, distant? Let me ask you, as I've had to ask myself, why do you read the Bible? Is it because you have a Bible study coming up, a sermon to prepare, a devotion to do with the children? Maybe you're thinking about Christmas is coming and you know you're going to be around certain family members and one of them is an atheist, so you want to search the Scripture to get some answers so that you can have a, a response when they ask you for the hope that's within you and so you're searching or, or you know that this family member is, a, is struggling with this sin or they are a false convert and so you're searching the scriptures so that you can have evidence and information to pour out on them. But that's not how it was in the beginning. Remember when you first came to Him, it was about Him. It was about intimacy with Him. Remember when you dove into the Word and prayer, not because you just had a problem in your life, but because you wanted to behold Him. You wanted to be with Him. You wanted to hear from Him. You wanted to walk with Him. You wanted to know Him. You wanted to hear His heart. You wanted to understand His mind because there was an affection. There was an intimacy. You beheld the love of God and the cross of Christ and that meant something to you. You were impacted by it. And what did it do? It drove you to His Word because it was His Word. You sought the Scripture because it was written by the lover of your soul. You obeyed the Word because you did not want to grieve the Spirit who yearns jealously over you. You didn't want to grieve Him. You prayed because God is your Father. And you want to talk to your Father. This is the primary reason why we must let the Word of Christ dwell in us richly. That's first. But that's not all. That's, that, that's not the only reason. We are not isolated in our faith. Christianity is a personal relationship. God does not have grandchildren. You know what that means, children? You must come to Christ on your own. You cannot come to God because your father or your mother are saved. You're not saved because they are. You must personally repent and believe for your own soul's sake. It's a personal thing. But there is also a very reality, a very real reality of a collective nature of our salvation. Think of the language. We are the body of Christ, many members. We are the flock of the Good Shepherd. We are the bride of Christ. We are the children of our Father in heaven. There's a us and a we reality to our salvation. So that leads us to the, the question that I asked first, what is the outcome primarily for you to be running hard after God, loving Him, pursuing Him, treasuring Him, meditating upon Him, loving Him, fellowshipping with Him in a personal way. But there is another outcome. There's another reason for the Word of Christ dwelling within you richly. And what is that? What does our verse say? Teaching and admonishing who? One another. 
The Word of Christ is to dwell in you richly, not just for yourself, but for one another. That's amazing. And how are we to do this? Two things. Teaching and admonishing. Teaching one another and admonishing. What is admonishing? Admonishing means warning. Let's first think of teaching. What is, what is teaching? Well, it sounds exactly what it sounds like. It's to teach. It's to give truth. And how does this work itself out? Well, the Word of Christ has been dwelling in you individually all week. You've been reading it. You've been meditating on it. You've been chewing it. You've been memorizing it. You're trying to be like those lollards and getting verses in your heart. You're, you're just abiding in Him all week. And then we come together. And you find, you don't wait for someone to come to you, right? Like we talked about before, being equipped for the work of ministry so that we might all together build one another up for the sake of this maturity, right? We are seeking out one another for what purpose? To teach. To teach this word of Christ that's been dwelling in you and you have been opening up the word, you know, maybe on a Tuesday you were flipping through and you came upon a psalm and it jumped out on you like it never has before. And you saw things or you've been in the law or you've been in first or second Samuel or you're over in Philippians, you're in Revelation. Some things have been bursting out at you and you seek out a brother or a sister and you say, hey, can, can I? Let me tell you what the Lord has been teaching me. And you begin to share and you say, you know, you're opening Bibles. And you're proclaiming the truth of God and Christ and His Spirit. You're showing them what God has been showing you. We're teaching one another. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Or... It's the reality of as you are going through your day and you're at work and you're working on something and you're up to talking with the Lord, you're chewing on a verse, something about the way you're working, an illustration comes out, an analogy comes out, a parable comes out, and it's just like, whoa, I've never thought about this mundane thing I've been doing in this way. Now that I've been dwelling on Christ, it's alive. Or children, you've been playing with your toys and you were playing a game and then something, somehow, the word of Christ that was dwelling in you richly made this simple game of toys or tech somehow some truth came out you were watching a film and the word of Christ rose up inside of you and began to preach in your ears and now you look at this movie differently or you had to turn it off or whatever and so it's not just Bible study but it's all of life you're eating a meal you ever been eating a meal and suddenly the conversation, because the word of Christ that was dwelling in you richly, the whole conversation changed. And now this simple meal has become something altogether different. And you share that with one another. You're talking to one another about how the word of Christ has been dwelling within you. And we're teaching. We're teaching one another. I, I, I remember growing up, my father, my father... He used to sell incense and oils, like fragrant oils. And one of my fondest memories as a child was helping him put these incense in bags and with the little eyedropper put these oils in these little vials. I loved doing it. And I remember after I was done, I washed my hands, right, and it's time to go to bed, and I could still smell the incense. I could still smell the oils, no matter how long it was from the time I departed from his presence to the time I'm in my bed, the fragrance was still there. My, my question is, 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 are you teaching in this way that you are having the aroma of the word of Christ dwelling in you richly, coming out and staining and affecting all conversation, or when you get with your friends, kids, brothers and sisters, when we break up into fellowship and we begin to talk about literally the word or just work or life or whatever, is it absent from the aroma of Christ? We're supposed to be teaching one another. 
but not just teaching, admonishing, which is warning. What does this look like? Once again, this comes from the word of Christ dwelling in you richly. And so you have been feasting on the bread of life all week. Even last night, perhaps, you couldn't sleep because you were thinking about a certain brother and you haven't seen him or you've been thinking about a sister and y'all were texting throughout the week and you're seeing things in her life that are not good. You're seeing some unhealthy decisions. And as you're talking to them, your heart is being stirred up because the word of Christ is communicating in your mind and you have to say something corrective. Warning, admonishing, this is dangerous, brother or sister. Have you considered this, brother or sister? Have you thought about this? The Word says this. We're warning one another. We're teaching one another. You're hearing someone talk about a sermon or a book that they're reading or something that they're choosing to do. And Christ begins to speak in your ears because His Word has been dwelling in your heart. Now how do we do this? What does it say? Because if we just start teaching and we just start warning, it could be pandemonium. It could be terrifyingly bad, right? What is the qualifier that we're given here? What does it say? In all what? Wisdom. Not, not just, as my country brethren say, not just nilly-willy or willy-nilly. I don't know how it says. Uh, you know, you're not just flying off at the handle, saying whatever, coming, rebuking this person, and, you know, oh, I want to teach you a sermon. No, 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 with wisdom. What, what, what does that look like? In all wisdom, it begins with some questions that are being asked before you ever open your mouth. Questions like, who am I talking to right now? Is this an older man? What does Scripture say about addressing an older man? I'm not supposed to rebuke them, but I'm supposed to address them and exhort them as I would a father. Is this my mother? Maybe Christian, you're going to talk to your Christian parent. Is this my father? Is this a younger Christian? Not just in age, but in time with the Lord. Is this a weak or a fragile Christian? Is this a Christian who is a bruised reed? Is this someone who has just gone through great trial? Is this a brand new believer? Is this a proud Christian or a humble one? What is the situation that is at hand? Do I have a lot of time right now or do I just have a little bit? What is the relationship like with this person? Am I close with them? Have I just met them? Are they teachable? All of that will determine what is the best verse, what is the best statement, what is the best use of this time to teach or this time to warn. Sometimes there are so many things you say, well, where do I even begin? Have you ever found yourself in a situation where there's something like that? I mean, imagine, you know, you, you, you got the, like the, the EMT or children, the, the people who work in the ambulance, right? And the ambulance, they get there and they find this guy and he's been shot in the leg. He has a wound in his head and his finger is badly wounded. Okay, where do we begin? <laughs> Everything needs to be addressed, but what comes first? That is the idea of wisdom. What should be done in all wisdom? You talk to somebody and they start bringing up something about tongues and they, you can hear that, okay, there's error there. But then they also say something about the nature of God and there's error there. And then they say something about some ongoing sin in their life and there's error there. And you say, where do I begin? Lord, help me. 
You don't want to focus on this when this is what is needed for the moment. And so in all wisdom, Lord, let the word of Christ dwell in my heart richly, like we talked about. Not just facts, not just information, not just Bible verses that are memorized and notated. Yes, that's necessary. But Christ in you, the hope of glory, this abiding, fellowshipping with him, speaking to him, praying to him, Lord, what is necessary in this moment? Is this necessary to teach or to admonish. Douglas Moo, he puts it this way, he says, those doing the teaching and admonishing do them in appropriate ways governed by insight into the situation and the people being addressed. And there's another element here that I would want to really encourage you all with. I think the kids might really like this. Douglas Moo continues, and of course, in contrast to the previous text, this text gives to each member of the congregation the responsibility to teach and admonish other members. Christian children, you know what that means? That means you have a responsibility to teach and warn your pastor. Wives, you have a responsibility to teach and warn your husband. You do not have to be a pastor or a missionary or a preacher or an evangelist in order for this to apply to you. Because remember, Paul is writing to the Colossians and he doesn't say, hey, this is for the elders here. He says, let the word of Christ dwell in you. Who? All of you. How? Richly. For what purpose? Teaching and admonishing who? One another. As our brother Kenzie quoted our brother Vodi, that's everybody. <laughs> that's all of you. Brothers and sisters, you are all responsible to do this in all wisdom. That's encouraging. What is the only requirement? Chapter 3, verse 1. What does it say? If then, here's the requirement, you have been what? Raised with Christ. There's the requirement in order to be able to do what it says in verse 16. If then you have been raised with Christ, then you have a responsibility to admonish and teach one another in all wisdom. This is exactly what Paul said way back in chapter 1, verse 28 and 29. If this sounded familiar, it's because he said this already. Look, look at chapter 1, verse 28. Him we proclaim. And who is that him? Sorry, a little louder. Christ, amen. Him we proclaim. And notice what he says then. Warning everyone and what? Teaching everyone how? With all wisdom. This is literally what he just told us all to do. This was his life. Look at this. That we may present Everyone mature in Christ, for this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. This was Paul's life. This is what he was all about. This is what he did. This was his ministry. This was his focus. And it is yours and mine as well. If you are a Christian, you are not a bench warmer. If you are a soldier in the army of the Lord, you do not stand on the sidelines. You do not need to have an official position in order to teach and admonish. Every one of you is in the battle. Every one of you has the spirit. Every one of you knows the Lord. And we need one another in order to reach that full stature of maturity, which is the fullness of Christ. Now, some may say, but what about James 3.1? What does that say? Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Amen. 
That is a warning against everyone trying to become an official pastor, an official position. There are roles within the church, but that warning against everyone trying to jump into the pulpit is not, a, a, not permission or something to prevent you from fulfilling what is commanded here in Colossians 3.16. Every single one of you, brothers and sisters, God has given you his spirit. You have a responsibility to let that word of Christ dwell in you richly so that you not only can draw near to God yourself, but so that you can teach and admonish all of us. And there are many ways to do this. Within the congregation, there are many ways for us to teach and admonish one another. Paul gives us one example. Let me say that again. There are many ways to teach and admonish one another in all wisdom in the midst of the congregation of the saints. Prayer meeting, Lord's Supper, fellowship, breaking bread from house to house. One example, the one we will be focusing on and the time that remains that Paul gives us is singing. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. And here is the example that he gives on how to do that. One example, not the only. Singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart to God. Now, of all the examples that Paul could have given, doesn't it seem a little strange that he would go to singing? I mean, why, why not praying or evangelism, right? But singing. But in another sense, it makes great sense because singing is something that the Bible says much about. You know what Psalm 66, 4 says? And if you're taking notes, you might want to write down some of these uh, verses because for the sake of time, you might not give you time to turn there. But Psalm 66, 4, he says this, All the earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name, Selah. All the earth. Now is that just poetic language? All the earth? Brothers and sisters, no. The Lord God brings forth from His creation a response of song. Think of the birds. The birds from the high-pitched chirps of the finches and the robin to the low cooing of pigeons and doves, the hooting of owls. The world is filled with sounds from the animal kingdom. Cr crickets chirping, bees bug buzzing, dogs barking, lions roaring, cats purring, falcons squawking, deer bellowing, hyenas laughing, horses neighing, and bears growling. And that's not even to go into depth about the complexity of each one of these sounds. Do you know what they say about the whale, the song of the whale? They said... Marine biologists say that this is the most complex sound in the animal kingdom. The song of the whale can be heard for hundreds of miles. Now you may never hear a whale living in Texas, but let me tell you one that is absolutely amazing. Have you ever considered the coyote? I didn't. But listen to this. When people hear their howls, they often mistakenly assume the sounds are coming from a large pack of animals, all raising their voices at once. Have you ever heard that? You heard a coyote and you think, there must be like 3,000 of them out there. Their song. That may be the coyote's intent. When coyotes howl, they sound like a bigger pack than they really are. They accomplish this feat by utilizing a smart strategy, combining wavering howls with a rapid change in pitch. 
and by bouncing their howls off of objects in the environment, such as rocks, trees, or the far side of a valley, two or three coyotes can sound like a pack of ten or more, which makes them seem more formidable than they really are. What is the point here? All of the animal kingdom sings to the Lord. He says all of creation. What about the stars? Do stars sing? Listen to this from NASA. We can't hear it with our ears, but the stars in the sky are performing a concert, one that never stops. The biggest stars make the lowest, deepest sounds, like tubas and double basses. Small stars have high-pitched voices, like celestial flutes, these virtuosos don't just play one note at a time either. Our own sun has thousands of different sound waves bouncing around inside it at any given moment. And you know what the Lord says in Job? Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Live science, they say that the, the forest really does hum with life. There is evidence that insects and plants hear each other's sounds. Bees buzz at just the right frequency to release pollen from tomatoes and other flowering plants, and bark beetles may pick up the air bubble pops inside a plant. All of creation sings to the Lord. And what do we see from the angelic host? We heard some of that this morning. What does the song say? Hark the herald angels Sing. Is that accurate? You find it? Absolutely. In Luke 2.13, suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. And you say, wait, that says saying, but the word praising there is the idea of singing praises to God. At the highest point, the incarnation, and then you go to Revelation and you see song after song after song. The same thing is done. They sing a new song, which means they change the lyrics. Something about singing. Creation sings. Angels sing. There's something about singing that fits the occasion. Remember after the Israelites crossed the Red Sea, the Egyptians dashed and drowned behind them. And what happened? Then Moses and the people of Israel, Exodus 14, sang the song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. You see the point. After such a victory, a speech would have been inappropriate. There are some events that demand a song. There is something about singing that distinguishes itself from speaking. Creation sings. The angels sing. Not because they're commanded to, but because in the immediate presence of the Holy One, song bursts forth. The foundation of the temple was rebuilt in Ezra. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests and their vestments came forward with trumpets and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord according to the directions of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord for he is good. They weren't commanded to sing. They sang because they desired to. You know, God sings. 
Zephaniah 3.17, the Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with quiet singing. No, with loud singing. Our Lord sings and he sings loudly. The Lord always does what is perfect, which means the most perfect thing for the Lord to do at that moment is to sing. And what does Matthew 26 tell us about our Lord Jesus? When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Creation sings, angels sing, Jesus sings, God sings. And some people say, well, singing is just not my thing. I'm not musically inclined. Some people are more given to singing, but not me. Brothers and sisters, listen. The word of God commands you to sing. Psalms 9:11. Sing praises to the Lord who sits enthroned in Zion. Tell among the peoples his deeds. Psalm 30, verse 4. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints. Are you a saint? Sing praises to the Lord and give thanks to his holy name. Ephesians 5.18, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. In our verse, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns, spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart. To God. This is not a suggestion. This is a command from the King of all kings. Sing. The Lord of all lords commands you, whether you have a nice voice or not, sing. Sing, sing, sing. And think of it this way stars are singing. Birds are singing, bees are singing, plants are singing, angels are singing, God is singing. Will you be the one silent? Will you be the one to be found with your mouth closed when all of creation and the God of creation sings? That would be a shameful thing. Okay, so we must sing, but the question is, what must we sing? All songs are not equal, right? The Lord is not pleased with all music. Just because you sing doesn't mean God is applauding or pleased. In fact, Amos 5.21, God says some of his most strong rebukes. He says this, I hate, I despise your feasts. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. To the melody of your harps, I will not listen. They were singing. They were singing the right words. But God was not pleased. There are many songs being sung this morning, some with good words, some with bad, inside, outside the church, and with the majority of it, the Lord our God is not pleased. He despises the majority of the noise that mankind makes to music. There's music on the radio, it's godless, singing being performed in all languages for different reasons. A lack of singing is not the problem. It's not that people won't sing. It's not that they don't sing. The problem is the heart, the words, the reason. We're given three categories here. Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And you know what's so tragic is people focus all their attention on psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. But what is the main focus of that verse? The Word of Christ is the qualifier. Not the different genre or the different style. The issue is, first and foremost, the Word of Christ must be dwelling richly in order to teach and admonish 
through psalm, hymn, spiritual song. If the word of Christ is not the controlling factor, the guiding force, if the word of Christ is not what's soaked into the lyrics of the song, then it doesn't matter if you have a psalm, hymn, or spiritual song or not. The requirement is that the word of Christ is driving what is sung. Not how many stanzas, not the style essentially, but the content. It's not about whether it's culturally appropriate. It's not a rather, this is a song is easy to listen to or whether it stirs up the emotion. The question of questions is first and foremost, is this song consistent with the word of Christ? If we don't have that, there's no need to go any further. No need to talk about instruments or no instruments. No need to talk about whether we have the lighting up or down, whether we have hymnals or put it up here. None of that matters if the word of Christ is not guiding the song. But you know what? Sadly, that is the last thing that many churches care about. People leave churches over songs. There have been church splits because of choirs and whether or not someone gets to sing a solo, if someone doesn't get to sing their favorite song that reminds them of the old days. In fact, it is a sad reality. There are people who are on their way to hell because they have held on to unforgiveness because of some decision that was made about singing. And then some churches, they bring in unbelievers to play skillfully because the most important thing is not whether or not the word of Christ dwells richly, it's does it sonically sound good. So they bring in the lost to play beautiful music for the king's people to be led in worship. And then if that was not enough, people dividing over songs, people inviting the lost to lead the singing, the lyrics and the theology of many of the songs that call themselves Christian is terrible. The music is amazing. The vocals are amazing. The poetry is beautiful. And yet it is godless garbage. Why? Because they focus on the lost. They don't want to offend the lost. They don't want to say anything that might harm them or, or make them go away. And so they bring these cheesy, feel-good, weak, soft, self-help, self-centered trash in honor of the king. Either they're painting God as something that he's not, this garbage about the reckless love of God. God is not reckless. His love is not reckless. He is holy, righteous, and just. His wisdom is beyond searching out. There is nothing reckless about God. And we need to be asking, who is the God of our songs that we sing? Is He the God of the Word of Christ? Or is He the God of the culture? Some weak Jesus is my homeboy or Jesus is my boyfriend. Both of those crazy ideas are put in much music these days. Or if it's not painting a God that is weak and watered down, then it's a you, you, you focus of the music. It's meism. It's all about self. People say worship was good today. Well, how do you judge that? It made me feel good. I got chills. It made me cry. It made me feel this. It made me feel that. You see where the focus is? It's me, me, me. And they're actually singing that the most important person in all the universe is you. And that's not an overstatement. This is an actual lyric from a Hillsong song. God, you didn't want heaven without us, so Jesus, you brought heaven down. 
Piper commenting about this. He says it fits too easily into a theology of a God who created because he was lonely and then saved people for the same reason. He just can't be happy without us. This is the problem. So what are our lyrics supposed to be? There are times when we must be singing to God Himself. Right? Christ-centered, God-centered, Spirit-centered. Think of the words. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to Thee. See that? To Thee, Lord God Almighty. The song is focused to Him. Or this one. Beautiful Savior, Lord of the nations, Son of God and Son of Man. If you know it. Glory and honor, praise, adoration, now and forevermore be thine. Our songs must be focused upon the King, to Him, singing directly to Him. But that's not all. Remember the context, right? We're teaching and admonishing one another, even in our singing. So that means there are different categories that go here. Sometimes we're singing to one another about our God. If you know this one, His mercy is more. What love could remember no wrongs we have done omniscient all-knowing he counts not their sum thrown into a sea without bottom or shore our sins they are many his mercy is more notice god's not being spoken to is he we're speaking to one another there we're teaching one another about him That's necessary. Or this one, one of my favorite lines of all, the love of God. Could we with think the ocean fill and were the skies of parchment made were every star on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry nor could the scroll contain the whole though stretched from sky to sky what are we doing? We're not talking to Him. We're singing to one another about Him, about His mercy, about His love. And then sometimes we're actually singing songs. Some of our favorite songs do something different than this. We're just talking to one another, encouraging one another to do something. Brethren, we have met to worship. Brethren, we have met to worship and adore the Lord our God. Will you pray with all your power while we try to preach the word? All is vain unless the Spirit of the Holy One comes down. Brethren, pray and holy manna will be showered all around. See? What is that? Brethren, 
Let's pray. Brethren, let's remember we need to pray. We need the Spirit to fall upon us that we would have help. If that doesn't happen, we're not going to be helped. So let's pray. We're singing to one another, admonishing, teaching. Sometimes we need to be admonished to suffer well. Be gone unbelief. How bitter that cup. No heart can conceive which he drank quite up that sinners might live. His way was much rougher and darker than mine. Now listen to these words. Did Christ my Lord suffer and shall I repine? Did Christ my Lord suffer and shall I repine? Yeah, that, that's convicting. I've been complaining about my issues all week, and we get together, and we're teaching one another, look, Christ suffered more. Don't throw in the towel. We need help to think with an eternal mindset. A mighty fortress? That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. The Spirit and the gifts are ours through him who with us sideth. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also. The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. See that? I need to remember there's an eternal mindset I need to have. There's a kingdom and family may cut me off. Life may bring me to the point where they want to kill me, but I will remember that there is a king. He is a fortress. He is mighty. The devil may come, but that devil bows before the Lord who has a word that will send him fleeing. This is teach. This is admonishing. Sometimes we need to sing to our own soul. Am I a soldier of the cross? Are there no foes for me to face? Must I not stem the flood? Is this vile world a friend to grace to help me on to God? Sure, I must fight if I would reign. Increase my courage, Lord. I'll bear the toil, endure the pain, supported by thy word. There he talks to himself. There there's a unity, and there he's crying out to God. Our songs, there's all of this. So, what are these psalms and hymns and spiritual songs? What, what, what are these categories? Well, basically a psalm means, the Greek word means, a song of praise to the plucking of strings. So it's like what Kinsey would do with his guitar. He's plucking his guitar and he's singing. That's what it means. The idea of the psalm is a scripture song. It's not relegated to the psalms. It's anything from Genesis to Revelation. It could be from the Gospels, it could be from the Law, it could be from the Prophets, it could be from any book of the Bible. These are the only songs that are perfect because they're written by the perfect God. We sing these. Some of y'all know Psalm 19. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired, more to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycombs. It's beautiful. 
It's beautiful. That's what we do. We sing the Psalms, but not just the Psalms. This was the idea of anything in Scripture that is written by our God with musical accompaniment. Hymns. The, the Greek word, uh, it's actually humnos. And so y'all know like English, Spanish, and sometimes there's people who speak Spanglish, right? They've taken some English and Spanish and they've mixed it together. That's basically what the word hymn is. It's a transliteration. They took the Greek word and English and they just anglicized it and now we get the word hymn. And historically, it was a song that was dedicated to a god or a hero. It was a song of praise and honor and glorying of someone who was worthy of such a thing. That's how the pagans did it. Well, we as Christians, we sing our hymns to our Christ, to our God, songs of his conquering, songs of his triumphant, songs of his his beauty and his praise, and that's what these are. And in fact, even in the scripture, um, for the sake of time, I won't read them to you, but write down Philippians 2, 5 through 11, and Colossians 1, 12 through 16. Historically, these were seen as the hymns of the early church. They sang hymns. But there's something you will notice about both of these passages. They are all about Christ. They focus on Christ. How could they let the word of Christ dwell in them richly when they didn't have a copy of their own Bible? They sang hymns. They sang songs. They memorized them and they sang the word. They sang the truths of God. And then you get spiritual songs. Well, what are these? I like John MacArthur's idea about it. He says he thinks these are songs of personal testimony of what God has done for us, in us, and through us. I like that. They are songs, and it's attached with spirit. These are songs of the spirit, things that he has worked in us, the work of the spirit. Think of the spirit of God in your life. This would include songs of testimony, of victory, of conquering. And we see the same thing in Scripture, right? We have songs that praise God for who He is, psalms and hymns, and then we have songs praising God for what He's done, spiritual songs. This is the collective reality of our song, of our singing. And the three categories give us another element that I hope to bring home here, diversity. Notice it doesn't just say sing hymns or sing psalms or sing spiritual songs. The reality is that our God has made this world with diversity. The animal kingdom has a diversity of sound. There is a diversity of color. There's a diversity of people and language and food and all of this. Certainly there will be a diversity when it comes to the way we sing and the sounds that we bring forth. Some songs are to be sung loud. Some songs are to be sung softly, but our songs and our music should match. Have you ever let your children pick out their own clothes? They might have like bright yellow rain boots and a camouflage jacket and a big red hat. I mean, it looks nice to them, but you're like, that doesn't match. When it comes to our music, there should be a matching. If we're singing songs of the joyful praise of God, then the music should be high and lively and exciting. And if we're singing songs stricken, smitten, afflicted by God, there should be something that accompanies it that brings us to that place. Our singing and our music should match. Quickly, why must we sing? We sing... We sing because we've been commanded, but more than that, we sing because we behold God. We know Him. We love Him. We sing whether it's in times of joy and celebration. James 5 says, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. When you're cheerful, sing. But you know what we find in Habakkuk? 
Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my heart feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places to the choir master with stringed instruments. That was a song. They were going through great suffering and they sang in the midst of their suffering. Why must we sing? Why do you sing? Sing because you're cheerful. Sing because you're suffering. Sing because you're commanded. Sing because your heart is filled. What is our singing? It's the sermon before the sermon. It's our praise to God. It's proclaiming His majesty. It's preaching sound doctrine and theology. It's exalting the triune God. It's pointing sinners to Christ. It's encouraging the believers with the promises of eternity in the Word of God. It's to be upward and usward. And lastly, how must we sing? It says, with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Let me just bring this home. The stars sing. The angels sing. The animals sing. Even the trees sing. But only you, Christian, can sing the song of the redeemed. Why do you sing with thankfulness in your heart? Because no one else knows what you know. No one else. They can mouth the words. Angels will sing to the Lamb who was slain, but they don't know what it means to be the recipient of that blood poured out on behalf of sinners. They don't know what it is to be forgiven. You do. They don't know what it is to be adopted. You do. Animals don't know what it is to be loved by God. You do. They don't know what it is to be indwelt by the God of all creation. You do. You sing with thankfulness in your heart because he knows you he loves you he chose you he adopted you he has brought you near and he is coming back to get you to be with him forever sing with thankfulness in your hearts to God don't be shy shout to the Lord Psalm 66 1 shout for joy to God all the earth sing the glory of his name how do you sing with thankfulness brothers and sisters what does the scripture say that he is coming back to get us as a bridegroom comes to get his bride you long to see him we don't just sing because the words are up there because our brother and sister start playing, not because it's time to sing. You sing with thankfulness because you love him. He loves you. You sing to help one another. I need to hear this truth from you, brothers and sisters. You don't know what somebody is struggling with when they come in here. And the right song may lead someone away from danger towards truth. Sing because we need to be reminded, encouraged, and edified. And I thought it would be fitting for us to end this with a song. So let's sing together and then you'll be dismissed. Mm -hmm.